And uh, recently, um, the um, administration uh, sought to make digital accessibility more of a, um, an actual effort that's more organized for the college. And in that, I work very closely with the Office of Disability Resources. So I'm part librarian, part accessibility, and I do a little bit of both. Some of you have met with me um, to discuss streaming options in your courses, and we're working on those. Um, but for today, I'd like to talk about the kinds of things that we've found with regard to teaching in the spring and some of the issues that came up for students. We talk about, I know Keith mentioned Bloom's taxonomy, but I think what we found in the, in the spring was sort of this Maslow over Bloom, right? Like if you don't have your basic needs met, and you don't have space to learn or you've got a difficult situation at home, it makes it that much harder for you to really fully engage in um, your own education. So there are a few things that we've discovered that faculty do um, and that faculty can do to make themselves more resilient and help their students be more resilient. I put a link to the presentation that I'm gonna be bringing up in um, the chat. So you can certainly take a look at that. I'm not gonna discuss everything on it. I'm gonna focus on three of the slides and let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, are you all able to see the online course audit? Yes, Keith? Perfect, okay. So one of the things that we discovered actually a couple of years ago, but that has continued and that we're sort of working with um, faculty on campus about are some repetitive problems that we've seen. Sometimes these will come after having taught for a long time and maybe importing a class from one Moodle to another. But some of these are issues that would come up even if you're brand new to the school. So we're going to go over some of them. And you can see them here. It's incomplete or, incomplete or repetitive course content. Sometimes that comes when you're bringing information over. Sometimes it comes when you are working on organizing information and you put something in as a placeholder and then go back and decide to put it somewhere else, but never deleted the first one. Um, and that is the same for duplicate in videos and images. Inaccessible videos is a big one. We have a, a lot of people who put in YouTube videos that have no captioning or that are private videos and they didn't realize that, that you know, maybe they've already authenticated in their browser so they don't realize that their students need a particular password for that. So all of that really needs to be checked. Images lacking alternative text, it's really important and you'll see in Moodle, you'll be prompted for a description of an item, um, but it's important that as you develop your courses for the first time especially, that you work that into your dynamic so that it doesn't become an onerous thing that you have to sort of retrofit afterward. Inconsistent linking is something that we found. So sometimes we find that people use the URL resource in Moodle. Sometimes people will drop the entire HTTP colon slash slash www string into the Moodle. Um, and sometimes people will take the title of something and then hyperlink it. So we ask that you not really drop in a full link with the HTTP colon slash slash because if you, um, if you do that, somebody who's using a text-to-speech reader is gonna hear that entire string rather than hearing the title of the link. Um, but whatever it is you choose to do, do it consistently so that you're, it's more predictable for your students. It'll be easier for them to clue into where things are over time. Um, broken links, outdated information obviously is more for um, people who have taught for a while, but I see some of you are here, so thank you for coming. Um, and then I call these bad scans. It's something that we're really fighting. You really want to try to avoid PDFs if you can. I know it sounds impossible. I know it sounds difficult, but especially now, try to avoid the format if possible. It causes a lot of problems with accessibility, um, especially if you're hand scanning. So if it's a PDF that came out of a database, it might be more accessible, but if it's something that you put on a scanner, it's really going to take a lot of work to make that, um, potentially a lot of work to make that fully accessible. So we're asking you to think outside the box, look for items that are in databases, look for things that are HTML. Um, HTML is the most accessible format that there is. Um, 
try to make sure you're not using something that's been written on, that's been highlighted, that has coffee stains. If you're, if you're gonna be hand scanning, make sure you're meticulous about how you do it and that things are properly cropped. That way, when you go to retrofit the, the file and make it more, you know, remediate it and make it accessible, it's, it's easier to do that. And then um, that sort of goes hand in hand with this idea of using accessible content, using inaccessible content when accessible content is available. This often happens with people who have um, used JSTOR files from the past. So maybe in your previous institution, you downloaded a file from JSTOR and you've kept it for yourself and now you're uploading it into Moodle. When you do that, you're basically pigeonholing that file into whatever it was in the year that you downloaded it. And in the meantime, JSTOR has probably upgraded the accessibility of it. So leave it to the big players who have the big money to do that remediation. And I'd like to see everybody sort of linking out to databases if possible. And then finally, we see a lot of copyright issues. Obviously, that's not my main focus, but certainly the library can't help you remediate something that goes well beyond fair use. And we're seeing that in the last you know, few months, we've had some flexibility from, from publishers giving us the ability to say, you know, uh, link an entire book. Um, but that's becoming more and more rare as time goes on and we live in a COVID world. So make sure that whatever it is that you're giving access to, that you actually are giving access to it appropriately so that you don't have any problems down the road. Okay. So design tips for accessibility in Moodle, never skip that discussion, that description prompt, I already said that. Um, consider pre-scheduling your announcements. Um, use the calendar feature. Make sure that modules are consistent. Even if they're arranged by date, make sure you have objectives, readings, assignments, etc., so that it's very clear for your students. We've found that this is a particular issue for students, especially on the spectrum, that get used to a certain format and then they get very confused and it's very difficult for them and remember just like some of you I've seen have children running around in the background or pets phones ringing people knocking on doors your students are going to be experiencing that we found as Keith mentioned in the spring some students are sharing a computer with everybody in their household. They only have a certain amount of time to, to use the computer and to get themselves into the mode and learn everything that they need to learn while they're looking at, at your class. So make it as simple for them as possible. Simple is better. Get rid of all the extra little design features and gifts. If you don't need them, strike them if you can. Okay. Um, use your course announcements. So if you're new to Moodle, the course announcements field not only goes in Moodle, but it automatically sends the student an email. So there's no excuse for missing um, a message that you're unavailable on a particular day or can't make your office hours or a, a test has been pushed back or something like that. So you really want to utilize the Moodle format as much as possible. There are a lot of bells and whistles in there that can help you. Um, and lastly, and most pertinent to a lot of the work that I do, is pay attention to the little gauges in Moodle that you're going to see. It's going to look like a little um, half circle, almost like a fuel gauge, and it will tell you if your files are good or bad, if they're healthy um, and accessible or if they're inaccessible. If you see red and a low gauge, that means you really need to think about whether or not you need that file because you may need to remediate it. You may need to look for an alternative file format. Um, if you put something in in the most accessible way possible, your students are not gonna see that gauge anyway. Okay, that's for you from us, okay? We've worked to, to make that available to you. It's a nudge to you. Your students, if it's accessible, will see a download link and they can take whatever information is in your Moodle, so long as it's accessible, and they can download it as a PDF. They can download it as a Word format. They can download it in Braille or as an MP3 or any, you know, of a variety of formats. So put them in the driver's seat to decide what they need in terms of the format. You provide the actual information and the content. Um, and finally, I know some of our faculty uh, colleagues will be talking about 
teaching away from Moodle, right? Some people use Slack in addition to Moodle or Discord. Um, one of the things that I would say is no matter where you are teaching, no matter what platform you're using, you want to make sure that it's accessible. It's easy to do that by really Googling whatever that is and accessibility, and you'll find complaints and forum posts about people saying, I can't get into this, I can't use this, I have a mobility issue, I can't navigate it. So it doesn't take very much to discover those issues, and it's worth a few minutes of, of looking at that. But again, whether you're in Moodle or whether you're somewhere else, you really want to focus on simplicity and consistency. That's the most important thing in terms of really getting the information across to your students. Um, one of the things we talked about with ODR was emphasizing that Moodle can be this protective and supportive tool for you because it's got that support for accessibility we know built in. Um, we know we, you've got support for design uh, with the TLTC and with me and with some of the librarians can help you with that as well. And there are a lot of automated features already built in to help you. We can't necessarily teach to all the tools that are out there. Certainly Keith has um, a good handle on those. And then so, finally, it's a good idea to just make sure, and ODR asked me to tell you, to make sure that you take a moment in your course to go over the syllabus and actually make it an assignment to ask some questions so that students are aware of your rules. Okay, okay. sorry. Yeah, okay, so thanks, Rebecca. Um, at this point, um, uh, Lee, why don't you go ahead? Sure thing. Um, so I couldn't get my mic to work before. You can all hear me now? Yes, yep. perfect. Great. Cool. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a little bit less than 10 minutes, hopefully, maybe, maybe even a little bit less than that because I know of our time here. Um, I'm Lee Tussman. I'm the uh, I'm assistant professor of new media and computer science. And what that means is I'm a dual hire. And so I work in both new media, which is in the film and media studies school. And then I also work in um, NSS and natural sciences in the math and computer science department. So I wear multiple hats here and I'm in my third year and I'm always happy, especially to new folks, but to anyone, if anyone wants to contact me, um, I'm happy to chat with you about anything I talk about now or anything else too, um, especially to new folks that have any questions about their experience teaching at Purchase. Um, I'm gonna start screen sharing and I will also monitor the chat at the same time. Feel free to ask questions and I will, um, and I can try to respond to that too. Can, can folks see my slides okay? Yep. Good, great. Okay, so I'm calling this creating a thriving classroom community remotely. Okay, so that sounds a little highfalutin. Here, here's what I'm talking about. I do some things in my classes to really create a culture of learning. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I did before coronavirus and then how I've adapted that during coronavirus, both kind of the ideas and then the technology that I'm using for this. Um, uh, so here's my goal. My goal basically is to create a successful community of learning that can support a virtual classroom learning as well as peer learning and support. So, um, and then my secondary goal is to build in some tools and procedures that fit your own teaching style and that aren't burdensome and that you can pick and choose um, and, and take what works for you. Lee, could you advance your slides just so we can read them? Though They're too small otherwise. Advance, advance them? Yeah, I mean... Uh, just I say, think, oh, thank you so much. I, I, I don't have the greatest eyesight, so I appreciate that. Oh, you know what I just realized? I'm sharing the wrong screen. So it would help if I chose the screen with the actual slideshow. The joys of using Zoom. Yep. And of course, how, how, how many times has this happened in your, in your class, right? This has happened to me a bunch. And in fact, I see that actually that screen is not available to share. Okay. <laughs> So I can share my entire screen. Uh, someone asked, is this a blue mic? Yes, I'm using the blue Yeti mic. It's about 150, which is a lot of money, but I actually think it's really helped when I do video recording quite a bit. Can you all see my slide much larger now? Great. Um, so, okay, so here's my pre-COVID methods for building a classroom culture of learning. So basically on day one, and some of the stuff you're gonna, sorry if some of this sounds very basic, but to me, it, these weren't necessarily basic things when I first was teaching. I learn everyone's names right away. I ask for and use people's pronouns. And I do this by using, um, by signing in, getting photographs of all my students, um, which is pretty helpful. You know, it has their name uh, next to their photograph. I print that out and I stick it next to my computer. Like 
you can see my hand covering the laptop. So I put it just to the left of the camera. And so I know my students' um, names and faces pretty quickly within a few hours. Um, I do use their, their um, pronouns. I have people introduce themselves with their pronouns. Um, it's just good etiquette. Uh, for students that, that are new to that, I think just modeling the behavior that you want to see is pretty important. I talk about my expectations for the classroom kind of rules and code of conduct, and I get buy-in from students and ask them if there are things that are important to them that I haven't included. This, again, might sound very basic, but students do care about these things. They'll bring that up, and if you show that you respect that and encourage that, it sets a tone that I think is really helpful in the classroom. And this also goes to, I wrote down here, find out students' goals. I also, I communicate what my learning objectives are, but I ask the students what their goals are. So some students might say, oh, okay, I just took this because this is, I'm required to do it for my major. That's totally fine, and they're, they're welcome to communicate that. But they might have secondary or tertiary goals that they want to get out of it. And I actually, I encourage students to kind of bring up these ideas, and then I address them either in that class or in a follow-up one where I say, Students brought up, you know, and I kind of list them and then I say, okay, well, we will cover this. I've added this to the curriculum or I think this would not fit in the course. You know, I, I basically try to address their, their goals. Um, I also ask what they're afraid about. I teach a lot of technical things in my classes because I'm teaching, for example, scripting for the web this semester. Um, so I'll, I'll try to address any kind of fears that they might have um, and just kind of put them out there, in, including what my own fears were when I was learning this kind of, these kinds of things. Um, and I also, a big thing is I try to encourage their, um, oops, I'm jumping ahead here. I'm trying to encourage their own um, interests, right? I'm really trying to support them in the interests that they have. Um, I, I care about what they care about and I wanna provide resources and references for them. Okay, so when coronavirus started, my office hours skyrocketed. So I think we're supposed to do two hours a week of office hours. I generally list at least an afternoon that I'm available on campus once a week that students can come in or, or other days that students can meet me. But I noticed that once coronavirus you know, was with us, I was getting requests to do meetings with students every day. And I think that's because a lot of times in the classroom, I actually informally do one-on-one -on -one check ins with my students. And this is especially helpful for issues of accessibility. This is helpful for students that are really shy that don't talk as much in a public setting, but I can talk with one-on-one. -on -one. And so to kind of work with these students, I really needed to step up my game of doing office hours. And that became really difficult. And, and, and it led to a lot of Zoom burnout, which you've probably all um, experienced already. It also doesn't support my goals of doing kind of um, many to many kinds of education instead of one to one or one to many. So um, I really needed to figure out something else. And, um, you know, this also fits with my own kind of classroom pedagogy too. Like I, I'm trying to help students pursue their own education and interests. And I don't want to be the sole expert or source of wisdom. I, I want to figure out a way and I want to support students and, and almost serve like a coach in certain ways to help students pursue their own learning. Um, so I needed a way to do that. So I turned to using Discord. So this next part, I'm going to show a tool. You do not have to use Discord. Discord is um, an alternative to Slack and Mattermost and even to tools that you can rustle up by combining things sort of in Moodle as well. Um, but I am gonna show you how I use this. Even if you don't wanna use Discord, you might get some ideas from it. From this graphic, I think you'll get a sense that this was designed originally for gamers. So for example, one strange thing about Discord is you have a pseudonym. Um, I created my pseudonym years ago, so I'm Leebot on there. So my students, when they're talking to me, they see that my name is Leebot. That is okay with me. I could change it to Professor Tussman. And then on my other groups, I'd still be Professor Tussman or Lee Tussman or something like that. But I've just gone with it. I, but I do want to note that part about it. And I just wanted to show you the interface for a second. On the left, you'll see um, basically these are the rooms. They call them channels. Uh, in the center is like an ongoing conversation. And on the right are, and I, I'm blurring things out because I believe in privacy. Um, is all, these are all the people that are online, at least at the time I took the screenshot. And this is maybe a more advanced room. When you start out of the box, Discord gives you a lobby, which says who's joined a general, which is um, a room just to have any conversation you want. I quickly add rules. I put our classroom etiquette rules that we agreed to, because I also want to remind students that this is an extension of the university, and that it's an extension of our, our campus community. And 
I'll talk about what the rooms are in just a second. I'm gonna pull up the chat because I can see now that people are asking some questions. Okay, great. Okay, so these are the rooms I would say that I developed in the middle of the course. And I'll show you in a second ones from the beginning of the course. Basically, you can just keep adding rooms or add these channels as you go along. Um, at a minimum, I would recommend having a general. And I created a co-working because students requested it. So this was a place for students to meet together as a group to work collaboratively on projects. Um, also, I was spamming my students with email about like events either in person or online once coronavirus started. Um, that related to the course, and I just wanted to be able to communicate that to students, so I created an upcoming events channel. Other things, at the end of the course, students asked me about internships and jobs, and they wanted to discuss it, so I created an opportunities list, and then I have a books, text, and reading group as well, which is where we can post um, the reading and, um, and also any articles. All of this parallels what I do on Moodle. I have the same information about their assignments, everything else on Moodle. I'm not showing you the Moodle because I, I think that's probably been well covered so far. Hopefully. Um, this is a conversation. And here's the good and the bad of, of this. What Discord is great at is allowing both an asynchronous and an and a synchronous conversation to continue. So throughout the week, even when I'm not teaching, students continue to communicate together and talk sometimes on informal things and sometimes on things relating to the class. I mean, it generally relates to the class, but you know, it might be more or less connected to what I've, what I've been teaching. But you know, students give each other lots of feedback. This is kind of incredible because it really does keep this classroom culture going in a way that I haven't been able to find with any other tool. The downside is that the conversation can really, if students are eager and they get eager, it can be a really fast conversation. So if you're not as active as I am on internet tools like this, but you do want to use this, I would tell students and write on your Moodle and on the, on, the, on the entry page of your Discord, I monitor the questions page and the rules page, or I monitor these two things, if you don't want to be engaged in ongoing conversations or have to be pressured to check that. For me, what this allows, though, is that students asking questions, I can answer it, and I answer these things publicly, and students can see the answers, and other students help um, debug or answer their questions, read each other's papers if that's allowed for an assignment. Um, it really kind of helps with collaboration. And it looks like I have a block here. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so I wanted to um, just chat very briefly about Moodle before I go. Um, sorry, about Zoom before I go. So um, I found, again, that Zoom often causes me to get exhausted after multiple hours. So sometimes we've just turned off of our camera and we just have a voice conversation. You can actually alternatively do this in Discord as well. And I found students prefer Discord, at least in my classes, for conversations because it allows them to combine kind of text and voice really naturally. You can do that in Zoom as well. I, I've just found that it helps sometimes. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about Zoom is sometimes um, I do office hours where I just turn on Zoom. Students know I'll be on for several hours. They're encouraged to kind of jump in. They can just leave their Zoom open. They're not even talking to me, but they're working on their projects. And if they have a question, they can ask me a question. It kind of feels like we're sitting in the same classroom or office together. Um, I, I want to suggest that as something that actually has worked really well in, um, for me and with my students. Um, and again, it makes me more accessible for them. Um, the last thing is just like a quick thing that you probably already know. Do what feels right and natural for you. Figure out how to set up a supportive environment and figure out how to make the tools work for you. Um, if you want to chat about any more of these ideas, uh, feel free to send me an email, lee.tussman at purchase.edu. Thanks. Thanks, Lee. Uh, so let's uh, switch over then to Yanine. Hi. Okay, so I'm Yanine. I'm an associate professor in psychology. Um, so I'm just going to cover a few other sorts of ideas and tips, and I'll try to be fast so that we have time to give Elise enough time to talk to because we're like really out of time. Okay, um, so just some things that I noticed from online teaching on purpose um, over the summer and also you know the transition we did last time. So some things you might want to think about. Um, first course content, it's really tempting to try to just 
do everything you would have done the way you would have done it normally and then just say, well, now it's online. And that's definitely the fastest. And I understand if that's sort of what you have to do. But ideally, online classes would have, you know, some sort of restructuring in place. So something to think about is the workload. Um, so I gave, I have a link for an online workload estimator just to make sure it's actually the right amount of time per credits that the students are taking. It is pretty common for classes that are online to end up actually being more work for the students than it's supposed to be. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, you guys have probably been told this already, but the lecturing that you would normally do is really best done in another format besides Zoom. It's a little hard um, for people to sort of focus on Zoom sessions and you can really utilize that time to engage the students in other ways. So it's best if you can to try to pre-record your lectures. That's also an added benefit for you if something happens, you already have that there. And it's good from the accessibility standpoint because then they just have it accessible whenever they need the recording and you don't have to worry about privacy issues or things like that if you were recording a lecture with the students there possibly talking or doing other things. Um, again, you may have heard that shorter videos are sort of ideal given that we didn't intend to have an online semester more than you know a month ago you probably can't adjust your content enough to figure out how to deliver everything in seven to 10 minutes. So I still need, you know, 20, 30 minute videos. Um, but what you can do if you have to go that route is things to encourage their attention and engagement. So you can try the HTP5 activity if you wanna insert like periodic multiple choice questions. Um, you can ask them to put comments in the voice thread. So you can like specifically solicit them and say, oh, here, pop in a comment here to answer this question. Um, or you could just, this is like the lowest effort on your part, say in the video, pause now and do this work. And then when you're done, keep going, right? And any of those things might help them sort of get through the longer videos. Um, but definitely think about what you're actually kind of going to teach them and in what format, what's in a reading now, what's in a lecture, what's in a Zoom session. Um, the next thing I would say is think about how they're gonna access the content um, if they get sick or fall behind. So again, if everything is Zoom live, it becomes really hard for a student who's out for two weeks to catch up, right? So again, if you have pre-recorded lectures, that solves a problem. If you have students take notes during live Zoom sessions, right, you could give them credit for this or have it be a shared activity. If they do like a Google Docs of the notes of the discussion, then that could be posted on Moodle for anybody who missed the live sessions that were more interactive. Um, for things that you might have gone over or even homework assignments, you might want to consider posting answer keys if that's not going to mess you up in the future so that again if they're not able to submit something and get your feedback they can still do the work self-grade and catch up after they're better um, then it kind of gets to well how easy is it going to be for them to know what to do so this touches back on what Rebecca said, consistency is really best. So consistency in your Moodle page, but also think about your schedule, like your syllabus and how to make that consistent. So I just posted here, this is an image of a little infographic that sort of summarizes my students expected schedule for research methods. So basically every Tuesday, Friday, they need to watch and react to the lecture videos. They have to read an online chapter and do a reading quiz. They have a synchronous learning session, right? So it's the same pattern every day, unless there's an exam. And that way, if it's like this, or if it's a checklist, they'll know really easily like what it is they have to do normally, but especially if they fall behind and are suddenly overwhelmed that they're two weeks behind in four classes, right? And also for that, like I think Rebecca said also, use the announcements form as much as possible. It doesn't just email them. The other benefit is it creates a written record that they can always check back to really easily in the Moodle, whereas an email can get buried very quickly and become hard to find. So the announcements forum, 
um, and Q&A forums, if you create those, are a really good way to go. And also just think about, you know, what are you going to do if you get sick, right? So think about your contingency plans, whether that's about getting sick or suddenly having emergency caretaking responsibilities. And again, so things like pre-recordings or backup plans and stuff like that, you really kind of want to just think about for your own sake. Grading. Again, just even more so than usual, make sure you're rewarding everything that you would value students do. And this includes, you know, showing up, right? So you want them to actually see an immediate value to doing these things because they're going to be making a lot of really tough decisions and balancing their lives and their families and all the chaos and then their classes. Um, and sometimes they don't see the longer term value of like, oh, well, I'll pass the test. They think they can do it regardless, but if you're giving them little pass fail points or things like that along the way, it might be the nudge they need to do the work that you really think is going to help them succeed. And as part of that, I just wanna emphasize like it should be a reward. So you don't want it to be like a punishment if they don't do it. And that can take a lot of finagling in terms of like the point system of your syllabus and your grading scale and sort of what can be interchanged with what else. And one thing that really helps with the flexibility is maybe counting a subset of what they have to do, right? So that also think about the two week, if they're sick for two weeks, right? You definitely don't wanna start penalizing at three absences because two weeks is four absences, just right off the bat if they're sick for two weeks, right? So think about your assignments, everything like that and give them that wiggle room. And it's also wiggle room for you so you're not dealing with a ton of you know, late work that you have to grade when you've already moved on. Similarly, think about flexibility for how students are gonna get their points, right? Again, especially with attendance, which might be very off and on. Um, so think about it more as like engagement points and make it sort of flexible, right? So you could give them points for showing up, but they could also get points for summarizing something for the class if they didn't show up. And that way you still know they're achieving the outcomes you want or learning the material you want, but you're giving them that flexibility in case they just could not make your Zoom session for some reason. Um, and then think about, again, just how are students going to catch up grading-wise if they get sick or something big comes up. So of course you wouldn't wanna have like a large scale paper that can't be made up, right? For obvious reasons, um, same for exams. So you wanna think really carefully about like your late policy or your dropping policy or something like that. But even with smaller scaffolded assignments, you have to think about, you know, if they're two weeks behind, what are you going to do? Are you gonna make them turn in every piece right, every chunk and every step all at once, at which point they're not getting the benefit of your feedback? Are you gonna stagger every deadline that they have on that assignment from then on, right? So just think about kind of how they're supposed to catch up and also what that burden is going to look like for you and how you would like to manage it. Um, so again, with that, it sort of makes you think about deadlines. So what flexibility is there gonna be with the assignment deadlines with exam deadlines, right? Work out what you think makes sense for you. Um, so in my classes, I'm going to be having a certain number of assignments and things that they can do late, and those will just be pass fail, right? So they're kind of like freebie ones. I still need them to do it, but I'm going to give them time if they need it, right? And those are just going to be known off the bat. There'll be a late stuff drop box kind of place where they can submit them to Moodle. So just whatever you choose, you want to be very clear with students. I'm not a huge fan of the like email me if you need an extension sort of policy because I know a lot of students and I was one myself who would never have had the courage to email a professor no matter how valid my reasons. So I prefer like the upfront, this is what you do if it's late so that they don't even need to talk to you if they had some emergency. They don't have to be embarrassed or ashamed or socially anxious about it. They can know they can just like upload it, no questions asked, and you'll still take it on whatever kind of point system. Um, and so things, you know, like I said, having a consistent place for them to submit late work is going to save you a lot of questions because you're going to have tons of late work, tons of requests for 
kind of different accommodations that we need to be considerate of, but you also need to be considerate of your own life. So if you plan ahead, hopefully it's sort of easier for you and also, you know, nicer for them. And sorry, I totally took too long anyway. Thanks, Janine. Uh, Elise, we'll turn it over to you for any, uh, take us out for it. Are we supposed to end at four or 4.15? Four. Okay. I'm just going to show you one thing then. Um, okay, so again, my name is Elise Lemire and I teach literature, so we, we're running out of time. So I, I think it takes just one student who's disengaged on his Zoom call to really take down the energy. So I would suggest that on Moodle you have a page that lists your Zoom requirements or your Zoom rules and etiquette. And I would additionally suggest that you consider asking your department to come up with such a list of requirements together. So this is the one we came up with in literature, and I do. I suspect we'll present this to humanities and, and perhaps ask if all of humanities would like to join us in having some sort of common list. Some of these things might strike you as funny. You should not be in bed or driving a vehicle. We have had students get in class last semester trying to drive their car and be in class at the same time. Um, I'm not saying I don't want to be uh, dismissive of students who obviously are carrying a lot of burdens, but some of these rules will help you ensure that your students are well lit, that you can see them, that they are not um, wearing their pajamas or whatever. Um, and again, this isn't meant to be um, onerous on students. It's really just meant to try to keep everyone um, present, uh, let them know that these are um, the expectations for everyone and that this set of expectations is not in fact coming from you. You're not particularly draconian. It is in fact coming from your colleagues in the entire department. So I'll leave it at that because we are out of time. Uh, thanks, thanks, Lee. Um, <laughs> at least uh, and we if, are. And if anyone would like that um, particular set of suggestions, just email me, and I'll happily email it to yeah. you. Yeah, actually, I, I would like it uh, okay. because uh, I mentioned in the chat. A and D has a similar kind of Zoom guidelines uh, that they've put together as a depart as a school. So. Um, it would be nice to have those all collected as examples someplace. So I don't know, maybe we can all put, we can put them all up on the TLTC website or someplace else so that um, there's a convenient place for people to go, to go look for um, suggestions about how um, uh, guidelines, ground rules to set for, for your live synchronous sessions. So uh, this was obviously way more than 45 minutes of uh, Zoom uh, session. Um, I did not start the recording right away, so whatever pearls of wisdom I had are lost in the ether. But I'm recording the rest of it, and we'll put this up on our YouTube channel. I'll uh, get the list of everyone who attended. I will send out the... Um, the link to the recording, as well as the um, um, links to our various Google Docs that were, were shared so that you can go back and review them. Uh, again, if you've got any questions about Moodle or any instructional technology or instructional design kinds of questions, you can email uh, tltc at purchase.edu and, and several of the faculty have put themselves out there as um, you know, being willing to, to take your questions as well. So at this point, um, since we are over time, I will stop the recording.